sweethearts, it's Rowan again, and I am getting ready not for a concert this week, unlike last week, and that was highly thwarted, wasn't it? Uh, but, um, well, I mean, it's got a concert-like aspect, I suppose. It's, uh, I am going to the, uh, Michigan Theater in downtown Ann Arbor uh, to see uh, one of their uh, annual screenings of a classic science horror. Last year it was uh, Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney. This year it's going to be Nosferatu. And I did notice last year Ah, uh, with last year's, uh, phantom screening, they, with the, with the silence, they just use a DVD projector. <laughs> they do, I noticed, like, they had the goddamn, <laughs> the goddamn menu screen <laughs> with the, you know, they just, they just mute the soundtrack and they, and they play it off of a DVD projector, which I'm like, why? Like, that's, I mean, on one hand, I guess, you know, it's probably cheaper than getting, you know, a film reel print, you know, or getting some kind of, you know, I guess maybe a professional digital copy, but, you know, no, it was just like, you know, the, the Kino Home Video, <laughs> it was just the Kino Home Video uh, DVD menu on there. I'm like, oh my god, I could have bought this, but then I wouldn't be seeing it you know, like on a huge uh, screen where I can see and read everything perfectly fine and not go off of memory for, you know, what I... Well, I'm, I have the title cards for Silence I'm, are actually, like, pretty legible, even on my tiny-ass television. It's tiny for me. It's like, it's a good size for a computer monitor, like, on my desk, but um, while in theory I was able to dumpster dive a kind of working uh, Sony flat screen that is huge. Like this thing, um, it's not as big as my as my friend Scott's um, flat screen, uh, which, you know, that thing is like, you know, because the measure television's on the diagonal, so like when you put his on the diagonal, it's almost as big as I am tall. Like its diagonal measurement is almost as big as I am tall, and that's the screen. They don't really count the, um, the frame on the, uh, on the thing there with uh, DVDs, or not DVDs, uh, television screens. I don't remember exactly why they measure television screens on the diagonal, but it's something that they've pretty much do been doing since the um, advent of home televisions. So, you know, whatever. Oh, that's not... Oh, that's right, I used one of these last week. Which I probably should wash these more, but it's my face. It's only going on my face. So, um, you know, I can actually do this all right from uh, the uh, thing. So, I I always think this every year. Uh, I go to the uh, the silent picture at a. Uh, at the Michigan Theater, I always think, you know, I really, you know, want to go, like, full vintage, uh, 20s, um, outfits, and I do have a couple, uh, you know, I did get that dress from the, uh, from that photo, um, shoot I did three years ago, no, it would be four years ago this coming April, I believe. No, or was it May? April or May. Uh, it would be four years ago this coming, so it's been three and a half years ago now, thereabouts. Um, I sliced my thumb cutting onions. Well, cutting an onion last night. Uh, but I always think to myself, I really ought to do, like, you know, authentic 20s drag, and I, uh, I never end up actually doing it. I always go, let's see, I think for Nosferatu, I just, I just went in my leather jacket because, you know, um, 
because, uh, you know, I just moved back into town uh, about a month and a half before, so, you know, I didn't really have any good vintage 20s clothes, um, but, uh, then what happened? So, I didn't have any good vintage 20s clothes, so, uh, but last year, I think the only thing I wore, uh, that was actually, um, vintage 20s was, uh, the, uh, this big-ass locket I've got. Um, I can't remember, and unfortunately, the photo that I posted to Instagram, it was not the greatest photo as far as being able to see my outfit. Did I just spit on my... Oh, no, this was in the sink. That's what's wet on me now. Um... And I don't remember if I wore the, uh, the, uh, the kimono or not. And I'm using kimono loosely. It's, like, not an authentic Japanese kimono. Um, but, uh, there was a bit of, um, and I'm using the historical term because that's how you would see it referred to in vintage magazines and um, anything on fashion history. There was a bit of an oriental trend in the uh, 20s for fashion. I can't remember if I wore that or not last year. So this was vintage mid-20s, I'm guessing, by the weight of the material and um, some of the fringe attached to it. It is definitely vintage 20s going by the material, but like the weight, I'm guessing, probably mid-20s, also good based on what I know about trends of that time. It was more likely mid-20s, um, you know, latest, probably 1926. Um, you know, it's, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous little, you know, um, kimono type, um, day robe sort of thing, um, but, uh, like I said, I'm using the term loosely just because it's not, it's got, in fact, like, the, uh, the embroidery on the back is clearly Chinese, so, <laughs> uh, you know, this was just, like, very, very generically done, obviously made for, you know, a Western, you know, fashion consumer, but, uh, it is, it is lovely, it is lovely. I can't remember if I wore that last year or not. Oh, there's where my sharpener went. Okay. So yeah, I can't remember if I wore the, uh, the little, um, day robe with that, uh, locket, but I do remember I wore my velvet cold shoulder cat suit, uh, which is vintage 90s, actually. Uh, I do know I wore that underneath, uh, but yeah, I can't remember if I wore the, uh, the robe or... Oh, wait, no, no, I didn't get my cape until January, so I might have worn the robe. I might have worn the robe, or I might have worn something else entirely over it, thinking, you know, I don't want to muss this up on the bus or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't remember what it was exactly that I wore, and I do know that the pictures that survive of that night with what I wore... Um, those, those weren't full body for me, so... Uh, I was out last night with uh, my friends Emily and Raven, and I'm going to check on them uh, from the bus. I'm going to text them from the bus just to make sure everything's okay, because Raven was having a little bit of an emotional upset. Um, and I don't know what about, and I did not want to pry, but I do want to check in and make sure that they're both all right. Uh, they are married, and they're very, they're, they're like nauseatingly cute. So much. <laughs> like, neither one of them are my type, really, you know, being all ladies and shit, but... Yes. This is vintage 30s. Um, the, uh, the lining, I noticed this last night, the lining had been redone at some point before I bought it. Like, you can really tell that is definitely a synthetic that did not, that, you know, that is not rayon. And, which I think was, like, the only synthetic fabric really available in the 20s and 30s. But, uh, um, this ribbon here might be rayon. 
Um, but yeah, this is, this is clearly some kind of polyester, which would explain why it was really warm last time I wore it. So I'm, it's getting kind of chilly, so I'm not worried about it with this. And there we go. You want to hang your capes on a padded velvet, um, this kind of hanger is called a coat hanger. And I'm wearing out this blouse and this skirt because skirts are easy on, easy off. We're in the front room. Oh, so much dust. Oh, so I just noticed the time. I'm not bringing out a pocket watch. What the hell? I'm not having pockets on. And in theory, I could haul ass right this minute and just barely make the bus. Unfortunately, I have pin curls to take out, so... <laughs> Guess I'm not hitting the post office before the movie. Like this just occurred to me, because this mirror is almost as long as I am tall. Here we go. Oh, ideally, I wanted to go out on the bus that is leaving in about three minutes, but that is not going to happen. Oh, actually, that did stay pretty easily. Um, but that is not going to happen. So, 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 so buttons. Um, at least not going to happen in a time that will, you know, mean I've got everything that I need before I go. So, I am changing my hat. This is... It's probably made with a vintage pattern. This is a uh, cloche style hat, pattern, but um, the, uh, the pile of the velvet and the fact that it's lined with polyester, and it's very clearly a polyester, uh, is making me think it's late 60s, maybe early 70s, because they're, uh, well, you know, uh, nostalgia comes in cycles, and um, there was a rash of... I'm gonna re-bandage my thumb. Uh, there was a rash of films set in the 20s, um, out in the um, early through mid-70s. Uh, let's see, there was... Oh, The Boyfriend, starring Twiggy, that was a Ken Russell one. Um, let's see, that was... That was vaguely set in the 20s, and very loosely based on the original musical from the 20s. Uh, it was more done as like this show within a show kind of thing. He rustled all over it. It was... <gasps> I do enjoy it. I do enjoy it. And he was generally um, faithful to the spirit of the era he set it in. A uh, film version of Great Gatsby starring Robert Redford and Mia Farrow. And we had Sam Watterson, who um, is probably best known to most people now. Let's see, he did the Lincoln film. He was also... Um, oh, God. I forget the character's name. I forget the character's name. He, he was the ADA on Law & Order Prime for most of its run to be quite honest. Uh, I think he was like the longest running character on uh, LNO Prime. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, he was, um, oh shit, not Gatsby, the third wheel. <laughs> Somebody did uh, a Photoshop of uh, various, you know, great novels with uh, um, 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 uh, accurate titles. <laughs> And they'd redone The Great Gatsby as, you know, My Summer as a Third Wheel. <laughs> and it's it's not wrong. That's not wrong. <laughs> but uh but yeah, uh so let's see. Gatsby uh film that was that was uh nineteen seventy four, I believe. And I really like that. In fact I refuse to watch the Baz Luhrmann um, reimagining of The Great Gatsby, because he's, he's gonna Lerman it all up. Like, I refuse to watch the Baz Luhrmann Gatsby. Uh, if you enjoyed that one, please explain to me why, and try your best to sell me on it. Like, try your best. I, I doubt you will. 
even if for some reason I'm at the library one day and I see a DVD there and I'm like, and I think to myself because, I don't know, maybe I'm drunk. I don't know why I'd be drunk at the library, but, you know, say hypothetically I'm drunk at the library and thinking, okay, well, you know, it's not going to cost me anything, like, you know, like renting it off of Amazon would, so sure, why not? It's probably just going to sit in my stack of, you know, things from the library that I need to watch or read. Um, and it's going to continuously move, be moved to the bottom until somebody puts out a request on it, in which case I'll just take it back to the library and probably never think about it again because it's Baz Luhrmann! Like, no, no. Uh, what time is it? Uh, uh, yeah, I should finish getting my shit together and stop rant. So, okay, now that I'm done, like, rambling on about Gatsby and how I do not trust... Baz Luhrmann to do that story, any kind of just... Oh, I should probably turn off the, uh, the antique lamp. See, other films made in the 70s, set in the 1920s or 30s. Uh, let's see, there's Paper Moon, uh, starring, uh, Tatum O'Neill, and she, uh, for the longest time, I don't remember if she's been dethroned yet, but she, for the longest time she held the Oscar for that film, uh, the youngest person to have a Best Actress Oscar <laughs> for Paper Moon. That was set early in the Depression. Uh, that's all it's really known. That's, like, the only, you know, concrete uh, time frame that uh, Paper Moon is given. So it's early in the Depression. So, like, might be... Um, oh, wait, no. Black Friday was... Uh, or, no, Black Tuesday. That's what it goes. I forget what day of the week that the stock market crashed in, the 20, in 1929. But... Uh, I do think it was in the winter, though. Was it? I don't know. Uh, so let's see. Paper Moon, set approximately, let's say, 1930 to 1932. Uh, that's all I remember. I mean, maybe it is, you know, said exactly what year it is. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. The Gatsby. I said that. Gatsby, Boyfriend, Paper Moon. I do love Paper Moon. I should watch that again. Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, The Wild Party with James Coco. Uh, I love him, and I love that one. And that was set, that was set, I want to say the year was late 20s, maybe mid 20s. Uh, it was very loosely based on uh, the Fatty Arbuckle scandals. And I say scandals, like, there were <laughs> several scandals of his. Uh, but yeah, the big one, the big one was based on the, uh, the rape allegation, which actually did not stick, and I think they even figured out that she was indeed, like, one of the, one of the, um, you know, few, like, genuinely false accusations. But yeah, like, uh, but yeah, that's loosely based on the Fatty Arbuckle scandal, um, or at least, you know, that's what a lot of people assumed anyway, at the, you know, when it came out, because, you know, James Coco actually did look, uh, is he still around? I don't know. Uh, James Coco actually did look quite a bit like Fatty Arbuckle in his prime. It was, so, like, that's, that's always what comes to mind, and I seem to remember watching TCM and, um, oh, shit, what's his name? The guy with the white hair. I forget. I forget now. So yeah, I was watching TCM, and that was coming on, and of course, you know, they prelude, you know, many of their films um, with this little info bit recited by, you know, whatever uh, person. And uh, this was the white-haired guy whose name I'm not remembering right now. Uh, he s said it was loosely based on the Fatty Arbuckle scandal. And like I said, that was 1976 it was released, and it was set... Uh, mid to late 20s, so let's figure 24 through 28, roughly. Whenever the Arbuckle scandal was, that's when it was. Uh, so yeah, that was, uh, so that's, uh, what is it, four or five, just immediately off the top of my head. Um, oh, Pennies from Heaven! Pennies from Heaven, starring, um, 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 what's it called? What's, what's his name? Steve Martin and Bernadette Peters. I love that one. I love Pennies from Heaven. I should have that. Why don't I have that? Uh, that was a bit more based on the, um, on the British, um, uh, miniseries, because it only ran one series, so I think they call it a miniseries. Or maybe it ran, I don't know, it was a short, it was a short run series, because it was only, you know, that's just the story they wanted to tell with that. So it was loosely based on the BBC series. I say loosely, I say loosely, it was musical, it was musical, uh, they took a, some 
liberties with the story that, you know, a lot of people criticized. It wasn't true to the, you know, source material. But yeah, that was set in the 20s. Uh, that was 77, 78, I believe, was Pennies from Heaven. And like I said, that was uh, Steve Martin and Bernadette Peters. Uh, now let's see. Then, um, starring uh, Gene Wilder and Carol Kane was The World's Greatest Lover. And I fucking love Carol Kane. She should definitely be in more things, but, you know, she's just got this unusual voice. And she's so, I think she's so pretty, you know, especially in her youth. She was so pretty, but, you know, in an unusually pretty way, like Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall was so beautiful when she, especially when she was young, especially when she was young. She was so beautiful. But, you know, she's, she got typecast somewhere along the way as the ugly actress. And I'm like, no, she's beautiful. She's beautiful. But, uh, yeah, this was uh, starring Carol Kane and um, uh, Gene Wilder. Uh, it was called The World's Greatest Lover. And it was basically a spoof. Uh, it was spoofing... Um, uh, Rudolph Valentino and the craze for Rudolph Valentino. Uh, <laughs> so, let's see. Uh, Gatsby, um, Boyfriend, uh, Wild Party. Um, Gatsby, Boyfriend, Wild Party. Uh, Paper Moon, um, Pennies from Heaven, uh, World's Greatest Lover. Um, those are the, all the big ones off the top of my head. Made in the 20s, set in the... Are made in the 70s, set in the 20s. <laughs> um, there's probably a couple more that I'm not immediately thinking of, but, you know, I've probably watched it. <laughs> I've probably watched it. I, I grew up just, like, in love with Art Deco and anything um, set in or about the 1920s. I loved silent films. Um, I watched them on TCM growing up when that was still a fairly new channel. Oh. Ah. So, uh, growing up, I loved just about anything that had anything to do with the 1920s and 30s. And obviously, that love never really ended. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I was really looking forward to the organ, which is usually over there. So they've got all these um, instruments up to the uh, stage right. I forget if it's reversed for the stage, but it's like to my right. So what the audience sees is right. Uh, they've got all these instruments off to the side of the screen. And I was really looking forward to the organ. <sighs> it's one of the things that I love about the, uh, the silent uh, film um, um, screenings is the organ. I love, I love their, uh, I, I love, I love the organ. I just, I, I do. I love. It's a, it's a theater organ, you know, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it sinks down. So I know that, you know, and plus they've got an organ schedule on the website, so I know it's not something that they got rid of it. Uh, and I did see our organ guy, and he recognized me, but I noticed he wasn't um, wearing, you know, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, his dress tails for when he plays. And I was like, what the hell? Okay. So, yeah, um, this is going to be interesting. I have mixed feelings at the beginning, but... Hopefully it, hopefully it works for the show. Very easily have been lost forever. 
uh, there was a lawsuit that uh, the widow of Brown Stoker won, and uh, as part of the lawsuit, they were going to burn all the copies. But uh, there was a copy in the United States, and that's why this still exists. And I'm hoping that there's a 1917 version of Phantom of the Opera out there someplace. Uh, it's lost. Nothing with the Greg Sherman wrote. Sorry, I'm talking about Greg. <laughs> Uh, but thank you to uh, Russ Collins, Michigan Theater, and of course Frank Uli, uh, the wonderful projectionist. And I think I've covered everything. Uh, couple, there's a couple of uh, homemade instruments here, um, and a bunch of toys, and if I start talking about them, then I'll never shut up.
so it's, I don't know, in the area of 9, so shortly after. Oh dear. So this is, this popcorn is basically my lunch and I forgot to pack my meds with me. So, let's see, I got about 10 minutes before the bus is due and I'm so glad that jackass was parked right where the bus is supposed to stop, here at the bus stop. He was parked like right there, like right in front of my line of sight that you can kind of discern from uh, the angle on my face here. Oh my god, this huge honking truck was parked and here comes somebody else who thinks that this is a parking spot. Oh god. So, as as is true of every time I see Nosferatu either at the uh, at the movie pal. Um you know this isn't a parking space, right? No, I'm not gonna park, I'm just dropping her off. Okay. Yeah. I think it's right? uh, so as is the case, every time I see uh, Nosferatu either at the movie palace or at home on the DVD, it was wonderful. I loved it. Uh, this year though. Um, I did include, a, I did take a couple clips and hopefully nothing got messed up when I uh, edit those in. So uh, they had this band uh, playing and they play experimental music because apparently the organ, the beautiful Barton organ that I love so much, God, I love that thing. That is reason alone to go out and see a silent film at the Michigan Theater. So, um, so the Barton organ is out for repairs right now. Uh, so there was a restoration project and it was half completed about two years ago. Uh, it got to playable condition, but they, uh, they, uh, they uh, made it through. And I don't even know why they had to do fundraisers because uh, probably just for the tax write-offs. Uh, a friend of a friend she uh, she used to date the son of <laughs> one of the uh, of one of the owners and the, the state and Michigan theaters they're owned by the same people they're fucking millionaires so you know there's no reason for them to do the fundraisers for the theater restoration project other than the tax write-off so um, granted if, it, if they took it from their own money that would be a tax write-off as well but whatever there's like you know yeah it's a non-profit theater um due to some whatever's um part of this art house collective okay that's fine that's fine still though um you know they could have gotten this done a lot sooner if they you know like actually decided that they are the patrons of the arts that they want people to believe they are and use their own goddamn money right but you know whatever so the uh the barton organ is out for repairs i was told it's not going to be back until november and that's okay that's technically only a couple weeks away but realistically i have no idea when i'm gonna go um see it get played again and speaking of november son of a bitch where'd it go but um so yeah the band was playing this beautiful experimental music that I love so much and I want their soundtrack for Nostra 2. But speaking of November at the theater, <gasps> the room! Oh my gosh, I have to go, like, when I get paid uh, in November's disability check, I'm just like hitting the dollar store and buying up all of their <laughs> plastic uh, <laughs> spoons. I am. I'm just doing it. That's because why the hell not? I'm. Why the hell not, right? So yeah, that's uh, <laughs> November 30th is they're playing that there. So, um, and because you're, you know, it's a different experience, you know, to watch a uh, to watch a film, even especially a silent film, at the. Uh, at the theater, or in this case, it's technically a movie palace, not, you know, a, uh, not your, uh, average modern cinema, so, of course, it does have a proper, uh, theater stage as well, so, because it's a different cinema, uh, experience seeing it at the theater versus seeing it at home, um, that, uh, uh, which includes the audience. Speaking of audience, I can't afford to go to Rocky Horror tomorrow. I'm kind of disappointed at this. I mean, there's only about 150 tickets left. Um, so, 
you know, whatever. I figured, um, God damn it, I'm dropping my lunch. So, I knew at the beginning of the month when I ended up, um, oh yeah, because the bedroom witch, you know, I only got a partial refund for that. Um, but, uh, oh, something else came up that took all of my money at the last minute. So, I knew from the beginning of the month that it was, uh, you know, if everything had gone as planned, especially with the bedroom witch, um, I could only afford to do either uh, Nosferatu or Rocky Horror, and I chose Nosferatu because it's like, you know, it's not like it's, I'm missing out on anything spectacular missing Rocky this year. I've missed it other years. I've missed Rocky Horror other years, so it's no big deal to me to miss it. But whenever they've got a silent film, especially with live accompaniment, I really love to go see that. And speaking of silent films, oh, I don't know if anybody saw on my Twitter yet. You might have if you watch me on Twitter. I have Twitter. It's in the box. So, um, there are so many uncultured people who don't understand how to properly appreciate silent cinema. And that became apparent during uh, this um, this year's um, screening of Nosferatu. Uh, the, uh, because it's silent, the acting, as I explained uh, before in a previous video, the acting is uh, it's modified from uh, pantomime and other theater traditions. So yes, like when you compare it to your modern, you know, Jodie Foster method acting um, actors, it can seem melodramatic, exaggerated, kind of hokey, um, but it's it's two completely different styles of acting. And there was just, there was too much laughter. There was too much laughter. People are reacting to this like it's a comedy. And like even with the soundtrack, which was beautifully arranged by the band this year, it was like, you know, I, I, and when it's a different, when it's a different uh, score for a silent film than you've seen before, it does, uh, it does bring, you know, it does help you appreciate the film in a whole new way, because that is how uh, silent cinema, that's one of the ways, you know, that we properly appreciate silent cinema, is to, you know, just take the score into consideration as you're watching it, and, you know, as you keep in mind that this is a very different um, form of acting than your modern um, sound film, and so... Uh, thankfully, there was one other person, uh, though I was waiting to get my ill-begotten popcorn tub refilled, <laughs> so I couldn't really follow her out and catch her name. But, uh, you know, because, uh, but, you know, basically she agrees with me that there were too many people laughing their asses off, especially at highly inappropriate scenes. <sighs> like, you know, there's a scene where, you know, the, uh, the, the town's, um mayor and whatnot, you know, just like, oh, you know, that, that it's the plague, it's the plague, everybody, you know, has got to board up the windows. People just start laughing at that title card. Like, like have, have you no basic empathy? This is, you know, this is a very human reaction, and you're treating it like this is slapstick Jim Carrey early years. Ugh. 